started here in a minute. Okay, well, welcome to the Understanding Employer Benefits Workshop today. We're really glad to see you and have you here. Um, my name is Megan Spaulding, and I'm a career advisor in the Albers Placement Center. Um, the Albers Placement Center is the career center for the business school. So we serve undergrad and grad students in uh, all things career planning. And as many of you are aware by now, for the last few weeks, we've been doing um, kind of a theme around our programming this quarter with post-grad life and doing some um, virtual workshops on topics um, kind of focused up around those for those who are graduating either from an undergrad degree or a grad degree in the next couple of weeks. We've just been doing some topics around kind of that transition period and what are some of the things that you'll be encountering or thinking about or going through or <laughs> um, kind of experiencing in the next couple of weeks as you transition into the next stage. And so today is our final event. And the topic today is around employer benefits, which um, I know when I got my first job, it was quite overwhelming. There we go. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I remember when I got my first got my first job, this was all a whole new language to me and, and learning. So hopefully, um, this will be really helpful in uh, kind of spelling all of that out for you today. Um, the rest of my team is here as well. We've got Mary Lou Moffitt, Justin Dolce, and Lori Milo. All of us are um, career advisors in the Placement Center, and we're really excited today to be partnering with our guest speaker, Mike Rask. Mike is an expert in this topic, and he has such great information to give you today. So I'm going to um, introduce him real quick. Um, Mike Rask is a senior vice president and is Aon's national practice leader for higher education. Aon is a pre professional services consulting firm. And in his role, Mike coordinates Aon's risk, health, retirement, and human capital solutions for colleges and universities throughout North America. He also serves on CUPA HR's National Corporate Advisory Council and URMIA's Affiliates Committee in support of these organizations' national, regional, and chapter leadership. Mike's based here in Seattle, and he has more than 30 years of, of consulting experience in employee benefits, risk management, human capital, and work-life programs. So you guys are going to get some really great, helpful information today. Mike, thanks for being here, and I will turn it over to you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Megan. And hello, everybody. And congratulations on your upcoming graduation. What a, what a tremendous accomplishment. There is so much open pavement in front of you, out, out your front windshield, and I'm very, very excited for what the future holds for all of you. One of the things that will occur is you will be employed, and boy, what a great opportunity to be coming out of school with the labor market as it is today, and the opportunity to secure employment. And along the way, you're going to have some decisions to make as it, as it relates to what types of benefits that will be made available to you. So as, as Megan mentioned, I work for Aon. We are a global professional services consulting firm. We have 50,000 employees in 120 countries. And we work in the areas of risk consulting, whether it's intellectual property or cyber liability or, or property and casualty retirement, all of the different types of retirement consulting programs and the investment advisory services surrounding that. As you can see, we have $3.3 trillion under asset management and then also healthcare. And today's conversation is going to be primarily around what are called your health and welfare benefits. I've put in red retirement. Retirement is a whole different animal, which we won't have time to go into today. But what I will tell you and, and really uh, suggest that you take this to heart is right now, when we look at employees between ages 45 and 55, today's employees between ages 45 and 55, 
over 50% of them have less than 25,000 in total savings. Over 50% of them. So the idea that they're gonna be able to retire in the next 10 years is highly unlikely. They're going to have to work much longer than that. So my coaching to you is those who are successful in life understand compounding interest. Once you get a job, start participating in the retirement programs, whatever they may be, whether it is a 403B plan, if you're with a not-for-profit organization, whether it's a 401k plan, set aside the maximum amount you can and don't ever touch it. The, the rewards it will bring for you, the, the opportunities it will make for you to have choices later in life as to how long you wanna work and the type of work you wanna do will all be set by what you can do over the next 10 years of savings and then having those dollars compound on top of each other. So with that in mind, we're gonna to chat today about health and, health and welfare benefits. These are your medical programs. These are your dental and vision programs. They're your disability and life programs. And we'll talk about how they're structured, how they work, and how and where you will share costs most likely with your employer. So as you can see here, I've laid out the ones we're gonna talk about, and we're gonna start with health plans. So there are a couple of different types of health plans that exist in the market today. There are what are called managed care programs, and you'll see there's a number of these different options here, whether it's a preferred provider organization, a health maintenance organization, and or uh, an exclusive provider organization. All of these have to deal with the network of providers that you will have access to. The, the opportunity here is that if you go to a preferred provider, if you go to an exclusive provider, the plan will pay more of the costs and you will pay less of the costs by choosing a provider that is providing those services at a lower expense per service. Where the market is going, these are more of the traditional indemnity programs. Where the market is going are what are called consumer-directed health plans. And the main one of these that is gaining traction are health savings accounts. These health savings accounts are designed especially for younger workers who have little or no health expenses as a way to be able to, to channel more of those dollars to yourself and instead of paying them out in premiums. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about these plans on the coming slides. So you can see there's a continuum here in terms of where there is less employee responsibility and gravitating from left to right to where there is more employee responsibility. As you start on the left with a health maintenance organization, which is like a Kaiser Permanente, you show up and you are managed through the experience there. There's very little choice except choosing which facility you're going to go to or which physician. But as you gravitate to the far right with a health savings account, especially with a high dollar deductible, now you're selecting how and where you wanna go for services. And you also have more control over the dollars that you're going to spend and or not spend. Hence the idea of a consumer directed plan. Most individuals spend more time uh, choosing a washer and dryer or choosing a high definition television than they do on healthcare most of the time. And there are vast differences in pricing and outcomes. And the importance of this becomes more and more relevant as you're dealing potentially with a chronic condition or an acute condition that arises in terms of what you're going to spend and ultimately what the outcomes will be for that type of service. In terms of expense, in terms of the premium cost that is shared between you and your employer, the most expensive plans, as you can see, are the PPO plans, the point of service plans, and what are called indemnity plans, which have really 
uh, just about disappeared, except with some unions and or some um, public sector employers will still have those types of programs. The least expensive from a premium standpoint are going to be the health savings account and a consumer directed health plan options. Here you can see how these different plans work. You'll start hearing some terms as you go to look at purchasing healthcare and making a choice in terms of what, uh, what it's going to uh, ask of you throughout the year when you incur expenses. So there's usually something called an annual deductible. And this is an amount, it's really the gateway to entry. Uh, this is uh, in essence where you will pay, pay the first $200 if you're a single or $600 if you're a family under an indemnity plan. You can see the variations across the way. Coinsurance, that is the percentage of the, of the costs after the deductible that will be paid by the plan. So in the indemnity option here on the left, uh, the plan's going to pay 80% of expenses and you'll be responsible for that 20% of expenses. Now, knowing that there's an unlimited amount of coverage available to a participant uh, and, being, and being subject to 20% of that expense upwards to a million dollars, most of us do not have those dollars, they, they put in place an annual out-of-pocket maximum. So that 20% that you would pay would max out at $1,000 for the year or $3,000 for a family. Other types of charges, whether it's doctor visits, inpatient hospital, emergency room, um, physical therapy, uh, 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 hard equipment that you might need, other things of that nature will all be subject to different percentages or may even have what are called copays, which, which are uh, in essence, just a dollar amount that you would pay up front before services are provided. All of these are gonna be unique, and, but you'll wanna look at them and also think about how and where do you incur expenses? And based off that, if you don't incur, incur a lot of expenses, you may decide that you want the lowest cost premium option and that you'll pay when you actually go for services. Others may have chronic conditions that, that need continuous care throughout the year. And you might wanna pay a higher premium amount versus paying more when you actually go for services as a way of amortizing your costs over the year versus getting a large lump sum at each time you go for services. Pharmacy is a big part of healthcare today. When I started many years ago, pharmacy made it maybe made up one out of every $8 or one out of every $10 of healthcare expenses. We now see with some industries, one out of every $3 is going to pharmacy. And it's caused by a number of reasons a lot of it is direct to consumer advertising. As if you go anywhere or read any magazine or, or shop online or anything, you are going to see, you are going to see that there are ads for pharmacy. There are different types of pharmaceutical drugs as are listed here. Brand name ones are ones that are under patent and they are marketed and those are the ones you see all the time. Once a brand name drug goes off of its patent, it moves into a generic category, which is significantly less. Often what you will see in these scenarios is uh, a difference. An average brand name drug costs around $80. An average generic drug may cost as low as $8. There is something called a formulary and your employer may choose a formulary to manage the drugs that are actually offered to you as a participant. And if you choose those formulary drugs, you'll be able to get an even deeper discount. Specialty drugs are the biggest uh, growing concern for employers today. Where the concern used to be um, medium-sized dollar cost drugs that went out to lots and lots and lots of people, What's happening today is these are very specialized drugs that deal with a very uh, unique situation, but have a significantly larger 
um, price tag associated with them. It's not uncommon for us to see specialty drugs that are as high as 100,000, 250,000 or $500,000 per dose or per treatment uh, now being covered under health plans. For the majority of us, you'll see that there's a generic, a brand formulary or preferred brand name and a brand name non-formulary down below here. You'll see what the copay amounts are that you would pay for these per prescription. Also, you'll see that there's a difference here between retail and, farm, uh, and mail order. If you're on a long-term um, maintenance medication, you're able to get a 90-day supply via mail order for significantly less than you would pay month by month by month by going to a retail pharmacy. Now, granted, a lot of us like to, to support our local pharmacists, to support, support our local um, uh, merchants, and, and you may choose to do that. But if you're wanting to save a little bit of expense, you can go about it this way. One of the things you will see with your employer is they may carve some of the benefits out from their typical insurance carrier. This may include prescription drugs, behavioral health as it relates to mental health and substance abuse, their employee assistance plan, and or disease management. All of these are designed really to save money, to provide a better member experience and to provide uh, access to unique services and resources that the insurance carrier may not be able to provide. Mental health and substance abuse is crucial in the workplace today. And this is an area that has been supported through government regulation as we had something called the Mental Health Parity Act. Prior to Mental Health Parity, uh, the Mental Health Parity Act mental health benefits may have been limited to just a couple hundred dollars a year. Today, mental health coverage needs to be provided the same as any other service and or uh, access point within a health plan, which is a great thing to have available for, for employees. Something else you'll hear about is something called an employee assistance program. These are de designed specifically to assist with financial counseling, dealing with elder care, family and marital counseling, behavioral health, all of these services are available at a phone call away, as well as the opportunity for upwards of three to five or unlimited visits with a counselor or uh, an individual with a master's of social work. Wellness is also becoming a key component and the idea of keeping employees healthy, whether it is mental, physical, spiritual, or emotional. It's gone well beyond just getting an annual physical. It's all designed around meeting you where you are. So take advantage of these programs. There are such things as a health risk appraisal where you'll fill out a number of questions in an online survey, and it'll give you an idea of how and where uh, and what your, your current health status is, as well as biometric screening. Take advantage of these to know what's happening with, with your health, your blood work and the like. And from, from that, they can develop wellness programs to help you uh, stay healthy and well. Any questions so far, Megan, that are coming through the chat? Nothing yet, Mike. Um... Okay. But I'll keep I put in there for yeah, everybody if you want to add questions to the chat or feel free to raise your hand we can kind of answer as we go along but I'll let you know Mike. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So dental plans. So we talked about medical there's naturally also dental programs and these all have very similar plan designs. There's also what is called dental PPOs and there's also delta or dental HMOs. What I can tell you about dental care is it works. Preventive dental care is crucial. If the coverage is made available to you, uh, in, invariably, if you have preventive dental care available, it'll pay for two cleanings a year. Take advantages of those. The, the research that is available that talks about the comorbidities that come from poor dental health are real and 
this type of care truly does work. If you need a, uh, a filling or something of that nature, that comes under the basic coverage and it's usually covered at 80%, as you can see. The preventive care generally is covered at 100% with no deductible, so it's free coverage. Go and get it twice a year. Major services could be crowns or inlays and the like. And then also they have dent, uh, orthodontia is uh, available under a number of different programs. So dental definitely is uh, a key differentiator and something to look for. Vision care uh, will, provide for, will provide for eye exams. It'll provide for lenses and frames and contact lenses. Uh, the types of programs out there often will have an in or out of network benefit. Some will coordinate with a Costco or someplace like that. Um, vision, vision is a nice benefit. It's a, it's a tactile benefit, but it's not an important benefit as much as some of the others that we're going to talk about. Uh, often vision is one that you can self-insure yourself, get in for an eye exam once every 12 months or 24 months, and it'll put you in a good position. Mike, there was a question on um, vision plans. Yes. Uh -huh. Do they typically include laser eye surgery or help they with would, that? They would not, no, okay. no. That, that would be a medical treatment mm -hmm. um, versus these are primarily around an exam and hardware, mm -hmm. either lenses or frames. Thank you. Yeah. And Mike, what are you seeing? This might be hard to answer because every company and plan is different. On average, how much should people be expecting to pay out of their paycheck for medical benefits every month? Do you have a kind of a average or? It's, it's going to vary naturally by the type of plan that's offered. We're seeing a lot of employers who um, are paying more and more because they're battling for talent right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're willing to do that. But generally, you can expect to pay for medical dental vision, I'm going to say somewhere between zero and $200 a month okay. based on the employer. And as you're looking at the offering from, from an employer, that's where you have to look at it holistically. You have to look at the pay. You have to look at the health care. You have to look at the, the retirement program and and or any stock options or, or other pieces, but you need to look at it holistically. Often I've seen individuals who will move from one employer to another for a small um, increase in pay, $2,000, $5,000, and give up almost $20,000 in benefits. Uh, so you, you've got to look at it uh, collectively as a full package and not silo them out. There are some, uh, many employers offer, offer something called pre-tax reimbursement accounts. These are designed to help you pay for expenses that you're already incurring, but it allows for you to pay for them with pre-tax dollars. And what that means is that you're going to pay 70 cents on the dollar versus a dollar for dollar for these services. They're broken into four areas. There's a healthcare, flexible spending account. There's a dependent care flexible spending account, <clears throat> as well as being able to pay for transit and parking. So these are deducted on a pre-tax basis. So you don't pay federal income tax or social security taxes. And then you will file a claim for reimbursement um, to once you, once you incur an expense. Now there's some things to keep in mind with these. On the healthcare side, these are for unreimbursed medical pieces. This is where someone could fund their LASIK eye surgery if it was not covered by their employer. They could set aside the dollars on a pre-tax basis and then be able to withdraw them. The cool thing about the healthcare one is, let's say you're gonna set aside $100 a month and your, your plan year runs from January to December. So over the course of the year at $100 a month, that's $1,200 a year. Let's say the LASIK eye surgery you're gonna have is January 15th and it costs $1,200. Well, 
you can draw out the full $1,200 in January to pay for that service and then continue to make your contributions through the rest of the year. On the dependent care side, the dependent care allows you to pay for child or elder care. The dollars have to be in the account before you can withdraw them. So you have to build up your account and then be able to, to pull them out. You can see you can set aside as much as $5,000 a year if you're single or married file, filing jointly for dependent care. The key things with these is if you are going to participate in a flexible spending account, there is a use it or lose it clause. If there are monies left over at the end of the year, they will be forfeited. You have 90 days after the end of the plan year to submit expenses, but you wanna make sure that you guess, guesstimate as best possible what expenses you're going to have so that you don't leave any monies on the table. You must re-enroll every year and you're not able to commingle the funds between the dependent care, the parking, uh, the transit and or uh, the healthcare spending accounts. Let's talk about disability. So you have a, it is three to five times more likely that you will be disabled during your working life than you will die. These are also you know, sometimes a little grim uh, conversations, but disability benefits for me are the most important benefits that you can have access to after healthcare. Healthcare ensures your health and wellness. Disability ensures your ability to earn an income if you're not able to work. Three years ago, my closest friend, he is the best water skier I ever ski with. He is the best snow skier I ever ski with. He was still playing um, competitive soccer, but he went up for a soccer tournament in uh, British Columbia and at age 58 had a stroke. He has recovered significantly, but he's no longer able to work as a band teacher. He's 58 years old, he's not 65. He still has another, another seven years before he would qualify for Social, Social Security, but he has long-term disability insurance and he is now still earning an income while disabled at home and unable to work. So think about how much money is going to be paid out now over the next eight years. They're going to pay 60% of his salary for the next eight years until he, actually until the next 10 years because he will go until age 67 is his uh, social security retirement age. So he is going to receive an income for the next 10 years that otherwise would not have been available to him. There are different types of disability coverages. There is workers' comp, so anything that happens on the job will be covered by what is called workers' comp, but short-term and long-term disability are designed for um, injuries and or illnesses that occur outside of the workplace. Short-term disability is designed for as, as it sounds like, um, disabilities that are going to run for a period of 60, 90, or 180 days. Uh, these could be due to a broken leg, um, uh, some sort of short-term um, short sur surgery, which is going to keep you out of the workplace. Uh, but, it, but it is uh, designed to, to help support you while you're on a short-term disability leave. Long-term disability re, um, replaces your income for that longer period of time. Generally, the replacement ratio is 60% today. We do see them as high as 75% with some unions um, and sometimes as low as 50%. The idea here is that it will start, it has a deductible, but the deductible is in days. So it'll either have a 90-day deductible or 180 day deductible before the benefit starts to pay. So the idea here, and one thing I can tell you 
is 20 years ago, the insurance carriers did everything in their pay power not to pay disability benefits. I mean, it was the, the equivalent of trying to, to navigate a maze to try and get disability benefits paid. What happened to the carriers is that when someone got onto disability, they stayed on forever and they had to reserve for this. The carrier's reserve started to increase and with that increase in reserve requirements came a drop in their financial rating. So they shifted completely and they now will do everything in their power to qualify you for disability early because the earlier they're able to help supporting you, start supporting you, the earlier you're going to be able to return to work. And that ultimately will reduce their reserves and that becomes a win-win-win for everybody. Some of, your, some of your employers may offer supplemental disability. So if it covers 60% of your salary, you might be able to buy up so it'll cover 75 or 80% of your salary as a way to be able to uh, protect yourself even more. So look for that if, it, if, if it's available. There's also the Family and Medical Leave Act. The Family and Medical Leave Act is designed to allow uh, employees to take time off to care for a family member, to care for themselves, um, to assist with uh, a newborn child or, and or the placement of a, an adopted or foster child. It can be taken as small as 15 minute increments. Uh, it is designed for employees who work more than 1200 hours a year. So that's a little more than, than half time. There's generally 2,080 hours in a full-time work year. So keep that in mind. Um, and it is designed to support you with how you go about supporting your family. Now let's talk about survival benefits. These are designed to protect the ones you love. Uh, these are designed to pay a benefit to a beneficiary. Life insurance often is paid for by your, your employer. Most employers will pay up to $50,000 in life insurance. Above that amount, you're going to pay some taxes for imputed income. Uh, also, you'll have the ab ability to buy up in uh, additional increments, whether it is um, usually in $1,000 or $10,000 increments. The benefits usually are provided to you either as a flat dollar amount, whether it's $50,000, $100,000, or as a multiple of salary, one times, two times, five, five times salary. <clears throat> you also have the ability, if you have a spouse or children, it, it may be offered to them as well. This is the gruesome, gruesomely named benefit, which is um, accidental death and dismemberment. <clears throat> this one is designed to pay an additional benefit if you were to die in an accident. So, um, whatever the life amount was, let's say it was $50,000. If you died in an accident, there would be an additional $50,000 paid, so a $100,000 benefit to your beneficiaries. <coughs> if you were injured outside of work in some way, um, there is a schedule, and we've just shown three of them here, but it, it goes all the way down to losing a toe or a finger or an eyeball, and, and they'll pay you a benefit for that. Supplemental coverage may be offered. Uh, supplemental benefits can be in dollar amounts, as you can see, or multiples of salary. All of this is paid by you uh, and uh, is, is made available to you. Keep in mind, these are all what are called term life benefits. It's a little bit like paying for your auto insurance or, or apartment insurance. There's no cash value that builds up. It is It pays you pay a premium for coverage for a specific period of time, and that is it. Um, a lot of us um, look to what are called whole life policies or ones that gain a cash value over time. And over time, if you have a financial advisor, they may recommend choosing that type of coverage. Usually that's purchased outside of the work environment and directly from an insurance company. Your employer may offer business travel accident. This will cover you and or loved ones who travel with you. 
either um, uh, while you're traveling on business and or if you tack on a personal trip along with it. This will pay for um, covering such things as injuries or accidents uh, or illness that occur while you're traveling and paying to get you back home. Voluntary benefits. So voluntary benefits are, are an interesting animal. And what I will say about them is they're becoming more and more popular. They're being offered more and more by employers. You've most likely seen the Aflac duck in commercials over time. What I can tell you about these is a lot of them uh, are designed for a very specific insurance. And I can also tell you that the commissions made by an Aflac rep are about 40 to 60% of the premiums. So that tells us that these are not high, high um, use claims that come into this. They are highly profitable to the insurance companies. And especially with things such as cancer insurance or critical illness insurance, when we go to buy car insurance, we buy, we buy car insurance. It's, for the, it's from fender to fender and everything in between. We don't go buy right fender insurance. We don't buy insurance that just says, if I get hit on my right front fender, it's going to pay a benefit. And that's what the cancer and critical illness benefits are designed for. That if you have a cancer and or a critical illness that develops while you're on the plan, not a pre-existing condition, that it will, it will pay a benefit. So if, if there are some critical illnesses in your, uh, your health history of your family, if cancer is a, a health concern uh, and, and that has been seen in your family um, uh, in the past, maybe it makes sense. But think carefully about it because uh, again, uh, these are highly commissioned products for the insurance companies. There are other things you can look at, group home and auto insurance. You can look at legal insurance. You can uh, purchase hospitalization coverage uh, that will, will cover you if, if you are hospitalized, as well as there's some financial planning benefits that are available. So cost sharing, how does cost sharing work with the, with the uh, employer? And Megan, this, this comes a little bit to what you were asking earlier. When you look to the left, these are generally the ones that are paid fully by the employer, the basic life insurance, the AD&D, short-term disability or long-term disability. The ones where there is cost sharing are in the middle, the medical, the dental, the vision insurance. Usually there's some sort of cost sharing in terms of the premium. And then finally, the pre-tax accounts, the dependent care and the healthcare accounts supplemental coverages and voluntary benefits are all paid for by the employee. Most employers, a good number of employers will, will work behind the scenes to determine whether they're going to use an, use an insurance company to pay for their coverages and or whether they're going to self-insure these programs. Um, if an employer is over 500 employees, most of them will self-insure the medical, the dental, the vision, and the short-term disability. Very few in, in employers insure the life insurance or long-term disability. What this means is often the employer is, is going to offer incentives if, you're self if they are self-funded to, to incentivize you to be a good purchaser of healthcare and to be able to use those dollars effectively in order to, to hold costs down. I'm gonna jump through this legislative overview. The reason I put this in here is you, we mentioned a couple things earlier. We, in, we uh, talked about mental health parity and we talked about uh, Family and Medical Leave Act. One thing that most people don't recognize, and I didn't know this when I came out of school is I thought Blue Cross or Aetna or Cigna were working under the old adage, if you build a better mousetrap, people will, will beat a path to your door. So I just thought the insurance company said, gosh, we're going to offer this $100 deductible and we're going to offer 50 days of um, 
of uh, rehab coverage and we're going to offer the, the pharmacy at this level and the healthcare at this. No, how it works is it's all driven by legislative and regulatory requirements. So what we have, and these are great requirements. Over time, the majority of these have made a lot of sense. We used to have something called in the 90s, drive-by maternity. What was happening is the plans and the employers were cramping down on a, woman, a woman's ability to stay in the hospital more than 24 hours after childbirth or more than 48 hours after a cesarean section. And so these, these rules, as you can see in the 90s, was the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act. They, they put into, per, um, into place ways to be able to, uh, for a woman to stay in the hospital a little bit longer if, if she was having complications after childbirth. We had mental health parity come into play to, to assist. We had the Affordable Care Act take the handcuffs off of employees who were stuck at a particular employer because they had a pre-existing condition and couldn't change from one, one employer to the next. Back in the 90s or in the 80s, we had something called COBRA, which allows for an employee to stay on the health plan up to 18 months after they leave their employer and not be um, kicked to the curb without any, any health care coverage. All of these things are very, very important to how and where we go as it relates to being able to have access to health care. You can see uh, there are other things such as ERISA and HIPAA. HIPAA is designed to protect your identifiable health information so that uh, it controls who has access to it and regulates those who can share your data and allows and helps to protect your data. So all of these things I, I just put into perspective is we're going to continue to see uh, changes to the benefits rules as new legislation comes into play. And uh, over, I would say 99% of these rules ultimately help consumers and have better access and better control over their health care. And naturally, we're going to see this as it relates to uh, personal health information, whether it's your gene sequencing uh, or, or other pieces uh, that develop over time. Well, I sure appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you today. I hope uh, my timing is, uh, looks like I'm still, we've got about 15 minutes left and uh, I will open it up to questions. That's great, Mike. Thank you. Such a clear overview. Um, well, there was a question earlier back when you were talking about health benefits. I want to make sure we got to um, what is typical as far as dependent coverage offerings? Kids. Kids and spouses. Yeah. So we'll start with spouses. Uh, one of the things that we've seen develop here over the past few years is that if your spouse is working and has access to coverage through um, through his or her or their um, health, health plan, they're not going to let you cover them under yours, or they're going to charge an extra surcharge because of that. So they're going to want your spouse uh, to be on, an, uh, on, on their own health plan if it's there. For covering the, the, the actual premiums, we're seeing as low as zero, in terms of not covering any of the dependent premiums, upwards to around 50% is we're seeing, where we're seeing a lot of employers uh, set, their, set their plans. Got it, okay. Any other questions, everybody? I have a question. Um, yeah, Mike, go for it. For students, if they are able to stay on their parents' plan until they're 26, um, is there any benefit to having two insurance plans or would it be better for them to, I guess, stay on their parents' plan and then transfer later? In most instances, staying on your parents' health plan until age 26 is, is a great deal. Uh, it's a great option. And then also, when you age out at age 26, you have access to COBRA and you can stay on their plan for another 18 months. So 
having access. Now, what you'll want to do is at that point, maybe you are transferring uh, onto your own coverage or you should shop and see what's available um, either through uh, an employer. If you, if you then become employed during that period of time, you need to transfer onto your employer's plan. Uh, but if you are still on your parent's plan during that 18 month period, it might be worth seeing what's available through the state exchange or directly through some insurance carriers to see if it's a lower premium or possibly higher benefits uh, through an additional option. But dual coverage is generally not recommended um, because you're, you're not gonna get the money's worth out of what you're paying for the additional premium. And I would take those dollars that you would have spent on the additional premium to use to pay for co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, those other out-of-pocket expenses. Thank you. Any other questions or? <clears throat> I have a follow-up to the dependents question. So okay. if, if the dependents, I have two children, if they're insured at say 50%, um, can you give me a ballpark for how much per month? that is looking as far as premiums? Sure, uh, that would probably be in the range of 600, mattering on the plan, probably some somewhere in the range of 600 to $800 a month. But you'd be able to pay for those on a pre-tax basis so you could take 30% off of that. So you're saying that amount would be 50% of their, yes, the that premium would be for 50%, both of them? Yes. Thank you. Uh huh. Anything else? Also, everybody, we are um, recording this today, and we have a um, Pretty much now all of our workshops have been on Zoom and we've been recording them. We have a, a playlist on YouTube through the Alberts YouTube um, where all of these will be located. So if you want to go back and reference them and all of the ones we've done for this post-grad life series are um, recorded there. I don't know if somebody from my team could kind of put in the link. Sorry to <laughs> last minute, but um, so if there's been some that you've missed, they are all recorded there and we break them down into chapters. The chapters are listed so you can kind of pick which parts of each workshop you wanna check out. This one will be up there in the next couple of days as well. So um, if you wanna reference back or if you knew somebody who couldn't attend, thank you, Lori. We just posted it in the chat, so. Great. Mike, thank you so much for doing this for us and breaking it all down. It's all <laughs> you made it much more clear and simple. <laughs> so, you are welcome. So thank, thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. I appreciate uh, seeing everybody. And again, best of luck with all your future endeavors. Take care. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And we hope you have a great rest of the week. And as always, Albers Placement Center is here if you need any kind of um, career support, career planning support. Um, if you're in the middle of, you know, job searching, negotiating, all that stuff going on as you're um, about to graduate, or even if you're just trying to figure out something for the summer and not graduating yet, just know that we're here to support you. So thank you so much for attending. Have a good day.